Hello everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Today we're going to talk a little bit about effects plugins architecture and how that plays out some in practice, uh, building on the things that we talked about last time. So this will be a very high level overview of what's a really complicated topic like most things I talk about. And uh, you will get a feel for it, and that's the most I can hope for, I think. So let's dive in and see what we can see. Uh, so what's an effects plugin architecture? Well, in the old days, and for a lot of studios today, you'd have what's called an effects rack. And an effects rack would literally be a big metal rack filled with rack mount devices. And you'd have lots of quarter inch audio cable lying around. And that would be used to plug your input signal into the first effect and to cable the first effect to the second effect and so forth. And so you'd end up with a giant pile of audio cable connecting a whole bunch of fancy effects boxes and that became the standard way for audio people to work with effects of course in the digital era the effects don't need a rack anymore typically at least in the modern digital era although many digital effects are racked and are connected with cable of some kind it's not a necessity of any kind most of that's going to be done in your normal working environment, which for many of us these days is a Linux, Windows, or Macintosh desktop or laptop computer. So at that point, you have several choices. You can do what eventually happened with office stuff where instead of having many standalone pieces that were pasted together somehow to make a working processing chain, you had a single all-in-one giant application that did everything itself. And that exists in the audio world. You can absolutely pay 10000 or 50000 or $100,000 for an audio processing studio software that has all the things. Or you could try to go the other older route and provide some way that different suppliers could supply different effects and they could all be fastened together and run in a way that was familiar to audio engineers. And that's the effects plug-in model in a nutshell. The necessity for the effects plug-in model is great in audio because the range of effects you will encounter and the ways that you want to wire those effects together are so large that it's just hard for a single manufacturer of a single piece of software to provide everything you'd need for the job. So that's where we're going with this. The effects plugins themselves typically have some standardized interface. And the nice thing about standards is that there's so many to choose from. Standards that I've worked with include LADSPA, LADSPA version 2, VSP. There's the Juice Audio standard for plugins and literally dozens of others, all of which want to provide a standard in interface for a large set of plugins that's a good interface for hooking them together and using. I'm going to concentrate on LADSPA today because it's the one that I'm the most familiar with. I have done some plugin development with LADSPA. LADSPA is an old, V1 is an old, old plugin standard for Linux. It's one of the first ones. You might ask, why for Linux? Why are these not cross platform? And the answer is that there's not great reasons. The Windows plugins typically don't operate on Linux because 
they require licenses and are proprietary and so there's no way to modify the plugins to work on Linux and the people selling that plugin architecture don't particularly care. The Linux plugins do tend to work on Windows, but people are concentrated on their more familiar plugins. So VST um, is pretty common in the Windows world and it's used in Linux some with wine interfaces and stuff like that, but it isn't a very satisfactory solution. So the idea, again, is to provide sort of load, loadable modules with a known API. And by the way, but when I say modules, I literally mean DLLs or .SOs, standard shared libraries is the typical format for these plugins, which has its own problems. I hope you didn't want to run plugins on a different CPU architecture than x86 or x86-64, because sorry. And the modules have typically an API that you can call into to send them a stream of samples, to send them controls. And those APIs aren't always different. Sometimes there's just generic input ports in these plugin architectures for so, for example, if I want a volume knob, that may be supplied the same way that a stream of audio is provided. Also, other control parameters that aren't naturally thought of as stream parameters. If I have a button, I probably want to have some separate kind of control for a button. And then I have to be able to get samples back out, so there's often some kind of call architecture or callback architecture to get the data out of the plugin when you're done. And finally, again, we have classic cockpit problem. I'll talk about this later. So the plugins want to have a say generally, the plugin authors generally want to have a say in how their controls, how their interface is rendered and interacted with. And that's a big adventure for audio play. For Ladspa, Plugins are available from all over the place. Uh, Linux distros have nice collections of plugins. There's other kinds of plugins out there on the internet for Ladspa. The attention has shifted away from it. So whatever plugins are out there now are mostly what you're gonna get. Uh, so that's a thing, but that's kind of nice in a way because it means that you don't have to be constantly churning at all. And of course, if you have these plugins, if you have these DLLs or shared libraries or whatever they are, you need something to load them all up and connect them together. And that's what is sometimes called a plugin host or sometimes referred to by analogy with the analog situation as a plugin rack. And I will show you an example of that in a moment, but I don't tend to use those for the simple kinds of things we're doing here. I tend to use Audacity, which is perfectly capable of loading and using effects plugins in the non-real-time situation. There's a lot of real-time Linux apps that actually will take Ladspa plugins. It's nice that way. Ladspa is interesting because it has a global registry of plugin IDs. You actually get an ID number associated with your plugin that's unique. So that's kind of an interesting idea, and it turns out to be kind of a good idea, and I wish other plugin, vent, plugin systems had a similar concept. But before I can show you a rack, I have to talk about the other thing that gets in the way at about this point. I'm going to mention Jack briefly right here, and that's really all I plan to say about Jack in this series of talks. It's its own thing. It's an example of a low latency professional audio setup. Windows has ASIO, which is a similar thing. Apple actually provides in its audio, I believe, some similar functionality, although I don't know Apple's audio well at all. And this is what happens when the needs of serious audio engineers and production audio people appear to diverge too much from the needs of normal desktop audio 
producers and consumers. On Linux, we have ALSA drivers for most of our hardware. And on top of that, we have LibALSA, which provides a lot of low level functionality for messing with audio. And on top of that, we have Pulse Audio, which is its whole own thing. But Pulse Audio is not a particularly low latency setup. It typically takes quite a while for it to run through that single path. It has its own unique issues as far as configuration and management. And so professional audio engineers are looking for something that has a different feature set. And they ended up with the Jack Audio Connection Kit, Jack, which is sits pretty close to the ALSA drivers and provides an interface that's supposed to be better for exactly the kind of application we're talking about today. The idea here, again, as we talked about last talk, is to minimize the latency in effects chains and in processing chains, and Jack's number one goal is to do that and to monitor that latency. And the other idea is that, again, there are so many standards to choose from. Maybe if everyone would just agree on Jack for everything. We wouldn't have to keep switching between ALSA and Pulse Audio, and it looks like pipe wires coming and blah, blah. Maybe one interface across platforms, maybe Windows could use Jack 2, maybe Mac could use Jack 2. And, oh, by the way, there is a Jack 2. And things would be better. I personally have found Jack be nightmarish. It doesn't often interrupt often doesn't interoperate well with other things on the system. And it takes a lot of management to get it up and running and keep it running. So I typically try to avoid it whenever possible. But there are some pieces of software that really want Jack and will only work with Jack. And one of those is the one I'm going to show. The real right answer, of course, is way more radical than just providing some paperish patch over desktop audio's difficulties, and that's to use a real-time operating system rather than a non-real-time operating system to do your serious audio stuff. Uh, audio and real-time go together really well because latency is job number one for an audio system. But of course, that's its own nightmare because now all your familiar tools and appurtenances are gone and everything has to be ported or made to work somehow. So there's no great easy answers, I think. And Jack is a compromise that works well for a lot of people in this space. So, like I say, if you have these effects plugins, you need something to plug into. And there's a bunch of jobs that this effects rack, this effects host is going to have to do. It's going to have to let you specify what effects you want, how they're going to be connected together into the chain. It's going to have to provide an interface so that you can control the individual plugins in the chain while you're using them. And it's going to have the job of actually running the signals, your PCM samples from the input to the rack through the effects and to the output of the rack. So it's a big piece of software, typically. Like I say, this is all inspired to some extent by what we call the cockpit problem in user interfaces, which is that audio engineers who are very, very familiar with analog racks and wiring effects together and turning the knobs are really uncomfortable with the idea that there would be some other interface they'd have to learn for this very, very complicated job. And so they are very much happier if you present something that looks familiar to them. And what that means is that things get weird a little bit really fast when you try to do things like provide knobs <laughs> 
which is not a user interface item that works well with a mouse and keyboard, for example. And so we'll talk about MIDI in a while. You can buy MIDI controllers that provide you with knobs, and then the rack has to deal with those. Many people use a digital mixing console. I have one downstairs to control all this stuff the way with an interface that looks like it would have been 1970 and things get interesting it's the thing is the cockpit problem is real you will take familiar a lot of times over ideal i think there's a lot of room to do better but there again good gui is hard maybe if there was some wonderful perfect gui it would be a compelling argument i want to just very briefly sh try to show you a effects rack as it plays out. This is CAF uh, Jack Rack. CAF Studio Gear is a reasonable example of this sort of thing, and it wants Jack effects. So I just want to show you kind of how that looks when you typically do it. Let me try to do a thing here so that I can make sure this is all working properly. That and then do this, and here we are. So this is a pretty simple effect setup. I've got the Jack interface that deals with Jack. Jack really is well instrumented and really wants to tell you about latency issues that you have and that sort of thing. And so you typically like to monitor that somehow with a tool so that's what this piece is over here this piece over here is jack's patch bay this is well a jack patch bay jack has an api for provide for doing connections and q jack control is sort of the standard consumer of that api and so you can see that i've got the things in the rack hooked together in various ways so that the rack is a functioning rack. This is the CAF jack rack itself and is a, you know, has a stack. It literally has rack mount screws along the side. That's how hard this is trying to be familiar to audio engineers. It has, I have three effects configured. I can add more. I can wire them together in arbitrary ways, either using jack stuff or using this internal built-in connector, which uses the jack stuff. And there's some basic knobs on the rack itself, which provide things like amplification and wet dry mix and things like that. So that's the sort of standard all plugins look alike interface. And then if you click the open button, you get the real interface, which again was designed to look as much as possible like a piece of rack mount gear, right down to the rack mount screws in the side of the equipment. And this is a compressor. We talked about compressors last time. You can see this is a soft knee compressor that right now is set for a compression ratio of about three, it looks like. So I can turn up the compression ratio if I can figure out how to operate soft knobs, which is always adventure. I guess the mouse wheel will do it. Think how much fun this was before wheel mice. And I can change that knee. I can increase the makeup gain to get my signal back to zero dB. I can change the threshold so that I start compressing earlier at lower volumes. I can change the attack and release times, and I can change the softness of that knee. If I want a sharp knee, I can turn it all the way down. So that's six knobs that I can use to operate this compressor. Oh, there's also these other four knobs. Oh, there's also this input knob, a bypass switch, which is both places. There's a mix switch to say how much you want to mix the compressed signal with the uncompressed signal, mix knob. And there's all these indicators and displays that try to show you um, what's going on. So that's one effect. Here's a tube distortion simulator thing called the saturator that they built. It has its own set of knobs. And here's a delay line, which we'll talk about in a while, which is 
reverb essentially and that has its own set of knobs and so really if i'm doing anything with this effects rack this stuff is going to probably be on my screen i'm counting four six seven eight eleven five is 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 26, 28, and 12 is 40 knobs that are active right now. And I've got three effects in the chain. And changing any one of these will affect potentially what's going on with my audio. So this is and of course that's just controlling the individual effects like i say i can also control how they're hooked together over here and do that. so that's the world of effects racks and effects hosting and it can be really rewarding to put together a big effects chain and an effects rack and understand how it works and have it do good things but as you can see it's not too much for the faint of heart uh I wanted to just look at an example Ladspa plugin to, or two to sort of understand how this architecture plays out in a non real time setting. And I thought the easiest way to do that would be to start with a plugin that does what's called MULA encoding. This is used in telephony. It turns out that, and we've talked about this before, it turns out that you have 14 bits of input and you need eight bits of output to get down your phone line rates down to something reasonable and so you use the standard the MULA standard to do that this is was used for telephony a lot and what it did was try to raise the quiet parts of the signal above the line noise so that you got better dynamic range and missed out on line noise but at the same time to reproduce the original signal reasonably faithfully. So this is nice because it's a simple time domain transformation. There's no history. I just look at the input sample level and move it. And it's nice because I implemented this one myself, so I know pretty well how it works. So before we actually go on and look at how this is implemented, it would be fun to see how it sounds. So let's give that a shot. I'll pull out Audacity here. And this is our original guitar track that I fixed up a little bit to get rid of the clipping, but otherwise it's the same. And you can hear what that sounds like native. And now let's listen to what the track sounds like after being MULA companded. What I did was go to Effects and Audacity, add and remove plugins to add the MULA plugin, and then apply the MULA plugin, MULA algorithm. You'll notice that it's, if you can see the text, that it's lowercase mu-la. Uh, I would love to have it be the Greek letter mu, but Audacity and C and everything in general doesn't like UTF-8 very much, so I tried and tried and was never able to get a Mew onto the screen, which is a little disappointing, but there we are. And let's hear what it sounds like having been run through the Mew encoder. So this has been what's called MULA Companded. I went through the compression to eight bits and then expanded it back to full range. So 
the amplitudes of samples are going to be discretized and that's the main thing that's been done here now the interesting thing is when i tried that with 8 bits it didn't sound to my ear any different than the original it sounded exactly the same and so i went and modified the plugin to do 5 bit mula instead and so that's representing only 31 possible sample level 32 possible sample levels that that signal if you look at the fi at the signal closely you'll see that there's only 32 sample levels in there 32 64 because right so because positive negative uh, it's actually eight bits it's actually five bits plus a sign bit and so that's interesting to me it's interesting that but if you did listen closely at five bits you could hear probably a hissy noise in the quiet parts that's what's called quantization noise it is effectively white noise introduced by discretizing into levels. So that's an example of an effect that's primarily an engineering effect. It's not used for much else. Let's actually look at the code to this effect because I think it's kind of interesting to see how these kinds of things play out in practice. Um, let me that open. So, first of all, you'll notice that the plugin appears to be written in XML, and that's true up to a point. The XML here is being used to document the plugin, but it also is being used to generate a lot of the code from. So, this is something called the SWH plugins. It's a venerable suite of Ladspo plugins and the plugins systems arc the plugin collections architect he didn't write all the plugins but he wrote some of them and architected the system thought this would be a good way to avoid repeat repetitive boilerplate c code and for the most part i'm reasonably happy with it it makes for a fairly short file but at the heart of it these plugins are written in C, and this is how we always did it in the old days. It was really the only choice you had, and a lot of times it's still the only reasonable choice you have. So there's some interface provided where I get an array called input of input samples and an array called output of to put the output samples in. And the job of my C code is to get the input sa samples out. They're conveniently in floating point, which is quite nice to work with although a little expensive and do what i want with them and then put the modified samples out and off i go again so this is the computation specified by the mu law standard which actually does a log of one plus mu this is the step and you'll notice that i set mu here to be 31 meaning five bits and so I take the mu here, I apply it to the absolute value of my signal, because this is a sine magnitude system as it turns out. Take the floor, and that's because logs of negative numbers are no good. So I take the floor of that times that divided by that, and so that's the discretizing part. It discretizes it to five bits. And then I do the inverse transformation, the mu-law inverse transformation to get it back out. I get the sign right, and then I write the modified sample to the output, do it once per sample. Notice that this is a really heavyweight plugin in terms of how much computation it does. I'm doing a floating point ABS call four multiplies, a log call, a floor call, a pow call, and a test and modify for each sample of the On my desktop, this is fine. If I wanted to do it on my embedded device, I'd probably have to be a lot more careful about how I wrote this. In fact, I moved to table-driven computations for the forward and backward thing. 
bit of most of the float. All depending. The so yeah, that's that. And it tells you that it's reasonably possible to build plugins yourself, which is great because this is an audio class. It's fun to build your own plugins. And I would encourage you to look into building plugins as one of the activities associated with the course because they're really a lot of fun to work with um, from the developer's point of view. Here's another one that is not mine, but is part of the SWH plugins collections, which I think is interesting. This is more of an effects plugin. So here's our compressed guitar sample. Solo that through a ways. I'm not going to do the whole thing because, but let's um, at least try listen to a little of it. So you can hear the effects of my compressor already applied to that, which aren't too perfect, but there we are. And then I can play the same thing, run through this tube simulator. So tubes provide some rectification. And again, this was a subtle effect. I had to turn the settings almost all the way up. This was some Norwegian graduate student's thesis project. Yes, you can do theses around audio processing to provide a reasonable low cost simulation of a tube amplifier's distortion. And Again, even with the knobs turned almost all the way up, it's a pretty subtle effect, but you can definitely hear it. And I think it's much, much nicer to listen to than the clipping, <laughs> the diode clipping distortion that we built earlier again that was just enable that plugin in the ladspa plugins and then apply valve saturation you can see this one has a user interface with a few knobs that you can play with to determine exactly how it's going to work so yeah there's some plugins and with that I think I've talked all about effects plugin systems that I feel like I have the energy to do. I hope this was useful for you. I hope it was informative. And I hope you're doing well out there. Talk to you again really soon. Thanks so much for listening.